Welcome to the podcast Konmoto. My name is Christina Petersen. I'm a Fan Christ practitioner in Lübeck that's located in northern Germany. And today my guest is John and I'm very happy because he is living much more north than I. And that's, I think it's the first time that I, I have a talk with someone from Sweden. Actually, he isn't from Sweden, but he is living at the moment in Sweden. And hello, John. Hello, Christina. Thanks for inviting me to join you on your podcast. Yes, you can hear she, um, he is from uh, the US. Mm -hmm. And um, we will find out during this conversation how this all end up in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, but maybe you can say a little bit about where are you at the moment right now? Yeah, physically or? Yes, uh, physically. <laughs> I'm living in a, out in the country in Sweden. Um, there aren't any known, known towns nearby. Um, I'm, the closest that people might know about is Malmö, which is about an hour and a half drive south of here. Um, I work up in the Uh, teach at a music school in um, uh, not a small city, well, a small city called Vekwe, um, where they have about a hundred thousand people, I think. So I have to drive an hour to go to work. Uh, so yeah, we live out in the middle of, our friend said to me, you don't live out in the middle of nowhere, but you can see it from where you live. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a nice <laughs> explanation. And I think you live in Smolin and that's also the um, where Pippi Langstrumpf is from, or oh, yeah. call her Pippi Langstrumpf mm -hmm. in Germany. I think they, she has different names in other countries, but she she is from there. So maybe people who are familiar with this girl from um, Astrid Lindgren, the mm -hmm. books, the books for children, uh, there she comes from. Yes, yeah, there is a, I think Astrid Lindgren's uh, residence there's a kind of a museum now is not too far from here i haven't been there but it's probably within an hour's drive or so so now uh, you are living in sweden but everything starts in another part of the world mm -hmm. and what i'm the most interested in is uh, who was the first person who spoke to you about the pedicrass method um, the very first, I was, uh, well, I was living in the States and I had studied music. Um, I went to a bachelor's and master's degree in music performance, trombone. And I had been doing some Alexander lessons um, with, a, I lived in San Francisco um, and I was freelancing there. And I was also taking orchestral auditions. And um, I was preparing for uh, an audition and the fellow who I was having Alexander lessons with, his name was John Burney, helped me both uh, on the physical side, but also on the mental side. He gave me some visualization exercises. And when I played that last audition, or one of the last auditions I played, I did very well, much better than I had ever done. And I almost got the job. Um, and then when, after I almost got the job, I thought, Yeah, actually, I don't really want to play in an orchestra. <laughs> um, I made the decision to get an orchestra job because I thought that would be the best way to earn money as a trombone player. Uh, and you can laugh at, you know, thinking that an orchestra job is financial security, but that's what I thought back then. So I kind of fell into a crisis. And I didn't know what, what to do with myself. I had always been interested in, in, in movement and And even when I was a teenager, I read the um, inner game of tennis and inner game of skiing. I was very interested in the kind of mind-body uh, dialogue, even when I was young. And so um, I looked around at different kind of things, uh, maybe doing some massage or, or Alexander. I considered um, some other, I visited other people's you know, uh, information evenings and stuff. And none of that really spoke to me. And then I... At that same time, I also had been sick. I had an illness that I was sick for six weeks. And I moved back to Colorado to stay with my parents for a little bit to get myself together financially because I had missed out on playing and, and stuff. 
So there um, was a workshop, Feldenkrais for Musicians, and I had no idea what it was, but my mom, who's a cello teacher, by the way, um, had saved an article from the Smithsonian Magazine about Feldenkrais from an author named Charles Fox, who had been a race car driver and had MS. And for some reason she saved that and we, she pulled it out and I read it and then there was this workshop the next day. So I went to the workshop and having no idea what it was. And that was, the workshop was by a woman named Margaret McIntyre who has done a lot of work with skiing in uh, Colorado in Vail. And um, we, were, we were asked to play before the, uh, a little bit and then we would play afterwards. And so I played a little bit and then we did a lesson. I, I remember the lesson, I think it was a pelvic clock. I was lying there on the floor thinking, this is really stupid. I don't need to take a rest. I can go much longer. You know, I, I had these things, but I went along with it. And can you bring us a little bit into the picture? Of what does it mean to, to do the pelvic clock? Oh, it was, you're rolling your pelvis, these very small movements on the floor. You're lying on your back and you're rolling your pelvis. Is, uh, on, and they use a clock. We use a clock to, to give it direction. So I think six o'clock was down towards the feet and rolling it up towards 12 o'clock up towards your head. So that, and then three o'clock and nine o'clock gives you, and then circles and, and then going around the clock like that. So that's the, the idea of, yeah, that's Feldenkrais jargon. Oh, the, the pelvic clock. But for those who don't know about it, that's... Um, so anyway, I got up and we were to play again and I stood much differently and my sound which was much different. So that really astonished me. Uh, I was shocked by that in a good way. And the other thing that I really liked was the idea about being your own authority, that you didn't have to believe anything, that trusting your experience was the most important aspect. And all the other kind of modalities that I looked at, there was something you had to believe. I mean, if you did, um, maybe not with massage, but I mean, there was, you know, there was always often a, a thought or, a, you know, a belief behind things. And, and I couldn't, my nature is that I can't really accept that. I need to find out for myself. So those two things, the experience of, of wow, I can sound different after an hour lying on the floor, rolling my pelvis and not having to believe anything made me decide I wanted to take a training <laughs> so, without any other knowledge. I mean, I basically asked Margaret, who should I go to? I want to learn this. And uh, she pointed me in the direction of a couple trainings. I ended up with uh, Paul Rubin and Julie Kasson in San Francisco. So that's a long answer to your question. But so interesting. So it was the really you did a workshop and it was more the practical entrance. You, you stepped into it and then you, you found out that's, that's what I'm looking for, that's good for me, it's interesting, and I will go straight to a training. <laughs> 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 Wonderful, it sounds a little bit like me, but <laughs> yeah, no story is uh, very same, but there, uh, there are similarities. So yeah. the, at the first moment, I had the feeling, oh, that's, that's me, that's for me, that's very good. But um, so you, you went to a training. How long was the distance, the, the time distance between the workshop and the starting of the training? I, was, uh, I think the workshop was in the beginning of the summer probably in June or something like that, May or June. And I started our training in, uh, I think it was October. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny because colleagues I had in the training had been going to ATM classes for years and getting FIs. I think I, I went, I got one or two FIs before the training. Um, I, just because I thought I should find out what that's about. And, but no, I had decided pretty much that that's what I was going to do. I mean, and so that was it. Yes. Hmm. Did you read the books between in these uh, months? No, I, I didn't. No, I read them once I got into the training, but I, I, uh, I didn't. No, I didn't do anything like that. I might have, I, I talked to some people who, uh, Alexander people who knew Feldenkrais work. And, and so I did talk to some people, but um no, no books, no, nothing. I would just, I wasn't compulsive. I was impulsive. 
Yes, so, um, I, I, I only ask this because I'm, yes, I'm a little bit like between you. The first time I did it, it was so impressive for me how it was for myself to what I discovered through the Feldenkrais lessons that I thought, oh, I have to read about it. But I have to confess that it was very hard for me at the beginning to read it and to understand what I'm reading. So I read the words, but it was like, what? It was so, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm speaking very open. It was so far away from what I re ever have read before. Mm -hmm. what, what, but I trusted the, what I felt and that I stepped into uh, I think also pretty soon in the Feldenkrais training. But I met through this um, podcast people who really their approach to the Feldenkrais method was through reading. Mm -hmm. Or there were so much in reading they understood they tried to um, find things out by themselves only by reading the words and then they did their investigation. That's so interesting how we are all different and ending up later in the training and everyone will be a beautiful and very good fan um, practitioner at the end. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that this is something what can work out in each way <laughs> so um so yeah and can you talk a little bit about what was your main change during the training or your main insight mm -hmm. or what you yeah at the beginning there was to make it more clear but the beginning i think it was what you felt that's good i want to do something like this that's amazing but what was your process in the training mm -hmm. well part of my motivation for starting the training was i i wanted to find a way to work with people uh to to, to you know another way of earning a living other than just playing music so there was there was that part behind it um, and in the beginning, I sort of thought, oh, this would be a really good way to work on the physical aspect. But what became interesting to me was uh, uh, that isn't just the idea of posture or movement ease and those kind of things that people talk about, but the, this idea of learning to learn and there's a learning process. And that began to fascinate me more actually than the physical you know if i'm dividing them i know you can it's an artificial division but um then thinking of, of movement or or those kind of things and, and of course they go hand in hand with the thinking but um this idea of, of it being a, a, a learning methodology that began to interest me and how and if it's applicable in one area as in the feldenkrais training can you can you apply it in other areas like in teaching music was my interest. So that that probably in, in also being a trombone player when you sit in a symphony, I, I still continue performing while I was in my training. You have a lot of time, trombone players don't play a lot in a symphony. Um, so you have a lot of time to sit there. And so I began to observe my colleagues and that gave me an additional training and also thinking, oh, there's a prospective client and, and um, but just seeing how people use themselves while playing. And so having that opportunity to observe people in action and not knowing they're being observed. I mean, I wasn't staring, but I mean, you know, you just, you're there counting rests and you're waiting, waiting to play. So, you, you know, you look around. And um, so I, I learned a lot from being, uh, being able to observe my colleagues uh, in, in orchestras. Uh, that, so the biggest change though, was going from the idea of being, a, oh, this is a physical kind of, thing to oh there's there's a methodology of a learning methodology behind this and that began to influence my in you know i've always been interested in playing jazz actually and um i gave up in some point on it because i felt i i just i'm not the you know, i'm not creative enough to play and i felt some kind of security with with class more classical music because you had the notes and you sort of knew what you had to do and now i know in hindsight, that's a, 
an artificial distinction because you can improvise when you're playing notes as well. But at that time, or earlier, even before that time, I had kind of come to the conclusion that I would never really be able to play jazz, but I wanted to. So I, that the method gave me some hope that maybe I could learn uh, to play in a way that would be more satisfying to myself. So th those are the big, the, the two big changes that happened in the training um, was that realizing it's about, you know, that it could be a way of teaching and learning and also that maybe I can uh, find other creative aspects of myself that I didn't feel I had access to. Yeah. So what I see about your background, and I mean really the physical background, of, I see the room behind you, and it's really looking like that you are still very uh, into the music. So what I heard until now uh, is that maybe at the beginning there was more an idea to be like Phantom Price practitioner who maybe works with musicians and not so much the idea to, to stay in the musical practice, mm -hmm. like to have a living. But it looks like that you found a way to combine everything. Yes and no. Um, when, after my training, I moved to Switzerland and I thought I would work with um, musicians and I found that was really hard to get enough. Uh, and also I found that many musicians weren't, I guess I made the naive kind of assumption that, that every musician would be just as interested in, in exploring themselves as I was. <laughs> and <laughs> many are not. <laughs> and I did many a workshop where I couldn't understand why people weren't as excited as I was. And <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but it's also when sometimes I give an introduction uh, workshop that people come and say, oh, it's interesting, I will try it, oh, and then, and then they are not like standing up with lightning in the mm -hmm. eyes and like, a, oh, I, I, that's the only thing I will do until the end of my life and each day for three hours. Yeah. <laughs> I had to learn this lesson too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I built up a, a good practice with all, you know, all kinds of people. And I'm really thankful for that because I worked with you know, a, a broad spectrum of people from children to old people to people who have had strokes to, you know, the, the, and so I'm very, very thankful because I learned Uh, and it was a very meaningful time for me to have that practice. And during that time, I didn't play so much. Uh, I kept teaching. Uh, I had a private studio, about six trombone students, and I, I did a little playing uh, here and there. I would play some concerts, or I played in the, the Posaunen Choir, the trombone choir in Switzerland. But I wasn't practicing as much as I had been. And, and then uh, after some time, when I Uh, things in my personal life began to change. I wanted to come back to the playing. So um, I began playing more regularly and actively seeking out more opportunities to play. And also the taking up this question, how can I use what I've learned from my practice of the Feldenkrais method to, um, pos to better influence my, my own playing and also teaching of others? Um, so To go come back to why there's all this stuff here, I, I then moved to Sweden, and at that when I moved here, I thought, oh, I'll just take my practice and, and start up here, <laughs> which was also naive because that didn't work. And um, I found I've come to some ideas about why practices work and don't work, and we can talk about them if you want. But um, for now, I wasn't able to get my practice going here to to earn a living, so I started applying. For jobs and one of the jobs I applied for was as a trombone teacher uh, and um, last year I got it it was a 20% job and then I was a substitute in another school and this year I, I got an 80% job so I'm almost a full-time brass teacher now so <laughs> I've come it's kind of like going cir full circle I, I, I had this you know 18 year career or 20 year career as, as a Feldenkrais practitioner where that's what I did And I also became an assistant trainer. I've worked in trainings and 
done workshops uh, and now I'm kind of back where I started <laughs> teaching me, or as a teacher now instead of a student. And it, it feels right for me now. I mean, it's, uh, it's something like I needed to revisit this world back here. Yeah. yeah. Um, but from my perspective, I, I only can talk about myself, but I think I can see it also in you. Maybe you can prove me wrong, but it's that um, you to, to go into music, um, that means that you have to focus on the trombone or on music and on to play the piano. And that means a lot of focusing on something very special. Mm -hmm. You sit on the place, you, mm -hmm. you do this, or maybe you can't like, I, I couldn't do the, or the volleyball in this school because I was afraid of my finger, mm -hmm. fingertips. I liked the, the game and, but I only did this. I don't know the, the English word for this and not this so much. Oh, right, yeah. I was very good in this because, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the teacher said, oh, I know you have to go to the, um, and to play if you can study. So it's, uh, it's okay. Also my, my, my friends at school were okay with it. But what I want to say is you, and once you, you do something beside the school, what is um, 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 something what is um, also um, giving you borders in your life. Mm -hmm. You have to, to give away a little bit of yourself to do this. And this means, that there's something inside you, you like it so much. Mm -hmm. And I know your, your thoughts because to be a family class practitioner is also something you do this with not a clear career in your mind. Uh, there is nothing like if you study like um, something like medicine, you know what you will do with this mm -hmm. and with your career, but mm -hmm. not with a family class practitioner, uh, teacher training. Yeah. And uh, so I, I come to the point where I also thought every time in my life, I have to split. Maybe I am a fan press practitioner, maybe I'm a piano teacher. Mm. But now I see there are times you do more this and that. And mm -hmm. everything is really what you are. And mm -hmm. what you like to do. So you don't look so badly at the moment because you're only teaching the trombone. So what I, <laughs> I mean. And after a while, it can be that there's again more fail and cries in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm still I, I'm still giving a few FIs and I had a group up until Corona time. Um, and, uh, and so um, I've stopped teaching the group for now. I do plan to take it up again and, and I, I've, I'm gonna one of the things I want to do is introduce my colleagues at the music school to Feldenkrais because interestingly enough hardly anybody knows about it in the music school and um, so I've t taught them in ATM and um, they liked it so when things again we're dealing with this you know, new restrict just happening now here in Sweden that they're starting to clamp down again on people because um, of of COVID-19. Um, but after that, I think maybe there'll be some opportunity to hopefully introduce some of my ideas and, and also the, the method to my colleagues. Yeah. Well, Feldenkrais said, um, you can't teach anybody anything. You can only create the conditions in which they can learn. And that's something that, that I think about a lot. How do we create conditions in which people can learn? And I call it rather than giving them instructions. So um, a lot of the music teaching that I experience and, and I see a uh, witness uh, is, you know, you do this and this is right and that's wrong. And, and, and the idea being behind it after a while the student learns to become proficient on an instrument or with their voice, and then they begin to hear for themselves. Uh, my own experience was that it took me a long time to develop a trust of my own uh, what is that I could trust myself and what is good or not good or 
what I defined was good was based on what my teachers had told me and what the culture, I mean, the whole orchestra culture about what's appropriate and what, you know, there's this fairly narrow uh, band there of what's acceptable. And even in uh, uh, jazz, uh, which people, you know, is improv improvised, but there, there are schools of jazz or, or areas of jazz, which are very strict. You know, you, you, you speak with it. It's a language and you use that language and you don't, you know, a harmonic language and you don't de deviate from that. And so you have factions where the people who, who think bebop was the, the highest form in some way it is, but they don't like the modern jazz people because, you know, it's a different set of rules, a different kind of uh, harmonic language, even though it's improvisation. So even within that, you have, you have um, restrictions and restrictions can be helpful, but the teaching that I've experienced doesn't often help people to become their own authority, which was really what Feldenkrais was after in my mind. So how do you can create conditions for learning? For me, it's, it starts with how you talk to the kids. I'm teaching mostly kids. Um, that you ask them how something sounds before you tell them how it sounds. You ask them how they feel. Or, um, and of course, this is not only Feldenkrais. There are a lot of good music teachers now um, developing these ways of teaching. It's, uh, it's not just us, but I mean, I think Feldenkrais was ahead of his time in that kind of thinking. Um, so for me, it's about taking the ideas, like if you're teaching an ATM and asking a lot of questions and, and try also experimenting, how, try it this way and make it more that way, make it less that way. So you begin to have control over it rather than just saying, you know, do it this way. <laughs> uh, and so that's how I'm exploring teaching uh, and trying to develop that to a way that, that will hopefully turn out kids who are, I'm not so interested if they become musicians or not, but they can think for themselves. I, I also see that as my job as a teacher is, is uh, music is the vehicle, but it's not the main goal. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I have an, an example about what you are talking about. So I'm in the same situation as you. I'm a band press practitioner with everything of myself. <laughs> But also I like to teach the piano and I, I avoid to say that's wrong or right. And someone who is a little bit familiar with notes writing is that we have the crosses and the, they, they change the note to another key. Uh, to Sharps, yeah. The press. Sharps so yeah. that's, if they maybe forget this, I say, okay, take your pencil and you see and look for that you write them down and then they find out oh I forgot here the, to to play this so I don't say to them oh there was a mistake so I hear it but I don't say please um, play this in this uh, in this situation but I say oh take your pencil and go again through this or you do it the first time and then you will and they say oh I forgot about it oh yes they're standing across in front and I say okay yes and then maybe I say yes interesting yes so uh, it's more that I think that's a situation they can find out by themselves that there's a cross and that that's maybe the reason it's not so sounding so good mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes and also I had um, students which didn't hear it, even when it was Mozart. They mm. didn't hear that it is wrong without it. And I was devastated inside, but I knew it's a process and not everyone is like me that I press it and I was like, oh, it's wrong, I have to press this, <laughs> yes. And I, I have to take myself back and to say, okay, okay, I let her write. And when she is more approaching this through her intellectual uh, thinking, and then she was doing it. Then, oh yeah, it's standing there, I'm doing it. But I, I have a um, student in mind, when she was 14, 15, she started to develop to play so beautiful. And it was like with all the waves inside and going with the music, but it was, wasn't for her when she was 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That wasn't she. It was a little bit late, but then it came like overwhelming fast yeah. later, yeah. really yeah. later. And I had to be patient and very careful with her thought that she wanted to learn the, to play the piano. Even yeah. the parents say to me, really? should we stop? And I said, no, I go with her because she wants to come. She likes mm -hmm. to come. We have a good learning um, contract, mm -hmm. we both. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. at the end, it worked out. You no, know, she was lucky to have a patient teacher. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it. But do you have also um, like um, um, an example like this, how you deal with this these situations? Yeah, I mean, Part of that one with with the we call them accidentals when there's a change or you know the, uh, there's a uh, you know in the key signature. So if a child plays something wrong, um, a couple of ways I think about it now. One is is to play it two ways for them, or ask them to play it two ways. Say, can you uh, can you play it um, this way and you play the C natural there, and now can you play it and play it with the C sharp and does one sound better than the other? Or, you know, or how are they different? And so that often works. Uh, or sometimes I will play it for them and try to mimic what they're doing and, and try to play it in a different way, not uh, and say, which one of those do you like better? And then, but to go further and ask why, uh, why, what, what, what makes it different for you? So that's the other thing is we can go deeper and deeper into the questioning where we say, for example, um, did you, how did you, you know, they play something and they say, was it all, was it everything right? Well, no. So if you're going to play it again, what would you do differently? And often they say, well, play it better. Well, well, what does better mean? I mean, what would you change? So that you get into a more detailed way of asking, what would you, and also what would you like to change rather than say, oh, you should really play a C sharp here. Yeah. And, uh, or you play that note wrong, you should play the right note, but rather, uh, listen, and then getting them to listen to themselves. And that's, that's the, the other part is that, that, that listening um, and sensing or perceiving themselves and, and also asking them how it feels. Uh, did it, how did it feel when you played that wrong or that when that part didn't go so well? Did you feel like you're comfortable in your body or did you feel there's some stress or tension and, and, and bringing their attention to the kinesthetic sense, sense as well as the aural sense that, of the listening. So those are some ways that I, and it's, I find that kids who've in, often when you ask them, well, what, what do you think? They, 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 they kind of expect, well, you should, you're the teacher, you should tell me. And they don't trust their own experience. And, um, they've not, I don't think many kids haven't been given the opportunity to, to think for themselves. Um, so that, that's a, a kind of a basic start of where we can begin to create the, and then that also means accepting, like you say, oh, <laughs> they're playing the wrong note, but letting it go um, for now and trying to create the situation in which they'll discover it for themselves. That would be creating conditions for learning. So if they can discover that for themselves and fix it themselves, it'll be much more powerful than uh, and long lasting than if I tell them, you know, play this note or you play the wrong position or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for inspiring me so much. And uh, yes, I'm every time thinking about to use this like principle to uh, create situations where they can find out or that I teach them like when I, when they stop to have lessons that they have their own structure, how they can find out, am I right or not? <laughs> so this, yeah. and it's good to maybe to, to clap it or to write again, or to, to have possibilities to, to prove themselves right. Mm -hmm. Not that they are, they, they, need, they don't need me. And um, yeah, I, it's so interesting. I, I talked to, to a mother of a former student from me and she is now studying. And she said to me, it's so amazing how my daughter uses your, um, your structure 
you uh, taught her in the, uh, in the <laughs> piano lessons now in her study. She's mm. studying actually in, in Switzerland now. Mm -hmm. uh, something completely different. And, but she says also, oh, then when I'm so uh, into it and I'm, I can't learn it further on, it's too hard, I do a little break. Mm -hmm. And I do something what I know. Mm -hmm. And then I come back. Mm -hmm. That's also, I think, oh, I, the breaks, the little breaks, but then to do it again mm -hmm. and in a different way. Or uh, that she is not stuck in a situation where she feels her border, but she, she steps back, she break, or, or maybe I have to read something else at the moment as a little break, and then I come back, and then mm -hmm. suddenly I understand so that she is going with her flow and not thinking I can't do this, I don't understand, but oh, I do something else. No. <laughs> and then no. it's it's something no. I use a lot in in when I teach the piano. No. I mean, as I understood it, what I heard from my trainer Paul Rubin was that when Feldenkrais did his first training in San Francisco, he wasn't expecting the his students to to go out and, and and do the same thing he was doing he was expecting them that they would take his ideas uh his methodology teaching into their own professions so he wasn't really expecting as, as i understand it that, that people were going to be teaching atm and, and having people lie on the low table and all that stuff that they were going to take his ideas of learning and and and, and take it into a different field and there's also a, a quote, I think it's in the Master Moves, where Feldenkrais said, I could teach what I'm teaching through mathematics. Yes. And that really intrigues me. And I would love to know more about, because I, I know so little about mathematics, about how that would be possible or what, he, what, was, what was the thinking behind that. But that's the kind of thing that I'm taking with music, is how can I teach the method through, through, through with the trombone or with the trumpet? And, um, and that to me would is then would prove, oh yes, it is a, a viable learning theory if that can be done. Otherwise it's, it's not. <laughs> and yeah. Talk yeah, then it. it's only a, mu a movement technique. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But it isn't, uh, there's a whole right. idea about learning behind yeah. it. And maybe you can agree to play a um, an instrument is more about moving then yes, it's not so far away from sport or, or like cleaning the house or something. It's mm -hmm. a, um, it sounds better, but uh, <laughs> yes. Well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, a lot of parents might rather have the house cleaned by the kids <laughs> than playing trombone. <laughs> I know. So that's a good part with the piano. <laughs> if it is in the right uh, pitch, then <laughs> it's everything is okay. They can do what they want. It's yeah. every time it's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's um, uh, there's no no split in between. So that is what I'm finding out now for myself. So that I don't have to decide so much. Am I a Feldenkrais practitioner or a music teacher? Mm -hmm. It's going between uh, the things. But the only thing I, I want to ask you, um, what I found out as a Feldenkrais practitioner, I'm really not so interested in build up patterns throughout what I'm teaching. It's mainly more like breaking up the pattern the, and to find out there's an, um, something else I can do. So to widen the potential. But when I uh, want to give someone to learn an instrument, there has to be something of building up patterns. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you can't play the piano, the trombone. You have to build up strong felt and wired in patterns mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that is okay i stop i the next 
thought in my mind, I maybe you you bring it, please. Okay. What what is speaking to you? What I right. So that it's um if I understand your question correctly, that there's that dilemma of in the Feldenkrais method, we're often taught to explore and do things differently, and there's no right way. Uh, and within music, there has got you know, at some point there will be a right way, other one no one wants to hear it. And I think I address that in, in a couple of ways. One is to say there are differences. I mean, the, the, the Feldenkrais method being uh, a, a tool, or in, in our sense, I, mean, I don't mean it's just a tool, but we can use a tool for exploring. And you could also have exploratory playing or exploratory improvisation where in which you, you're, there are no right, wrong, there are no wrong notes and, 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 and people can explore. So that would be one parallel. But when it comes to developing habits, I mean, we're, we're really talking about habits, uh, motor habits that are repeatable and reliable. They do take a lot of repetition. However, the, a lot of the learning, I also read into a lot of learning theory and motor learning theories and uh, is showing now that doing small variations, even on something you want to be consistent is gonna help with the consistency. So I see it as, as we in the beginning you might take huge variables like play that with a c sharp and play it with a c natural and hear how it's different and then later you might change the rhythm you know play it with dotted rhythms or or triplet rhythms or putting accents in different places and then later it becomes uh if it's a really fast something there may be subtle differences that no one would hear but you, you feel them or the person playing feels them you're playing a, a scale da, 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 and you know where do you put the uh, the emphasis and you da 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 da, da or da 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 da, da or those kind of things that and i think there we can take what we've learned from the feldenkrais method and and and, and help students and and but it has to become finer and finer so that at some point and it's the same way with an atm i mean if i do the think of doing the pelvic clock when we come back to that when i first did I was probably amazed that my pelvis could even move that way or that you could think of it that way and I had the sense after a couple of years I did that lesson again I thought wow I, I, I didn't have any idea about what was going on and now I have you know I've learned so much more I can feel so much more so that the the sensory world opens up but it also becomes more subtle at the same time so I think we do need to develop patterns and 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 of course, in life, we also need habits and patterns. We can't, you know, I'm going to, well, I'm going to cook food tonight. Uh, I think I'll try a little more salt, a little less salt. <laughs> you know, it's, it, you may be able to do that on a Saturday night, but you know, if you need to get your food done and, and you want it to taste well, uh, then, you, you know, you, you do what you know. <laughs> and uh, the same, or even driving the car, I'm going to work. Well, I don't necessarily going to take this street and see what happens and, you know, or drive on this side of the road and see what happens. Uh, you have to do you know, what's, what's uh, habitual. And of course, the question would be uh, how much choice do you have within that, that narrow, that narrow band? So that's how I, I think of that and how I address it. And, the other thing coming back to the variation, what I found personally, when you begin to vary things, you build a more complete map of the thing that you want to do. So even if you're going to play uh, a Mozart a sonatina or whatever in a certain way, and you're gonna do it at a certain tempo, if you've done it faster and slower, and if you've done it with different rhythms, you understand it better. So that when you do play it the way you always wanna play it, it will be richer in some way within you. There'll, there'll be a, a greater representation in your, in your mind and in your, you know, through, through your body uh, of how you play it. So it will be a more secure performance. It will be, you can also react to things that are, um, uh, that are un, you know, unexpected. Uh, someone coughs while you're playing or you're, if you're playing with other people and they all of a sudden go more slowly or, or speed up, you're able to, you're able to adjust with that. Uh, to uh, variables. So uh, during my um, contact with, uh, so my my training uh, for the uh, piano or the music, I um I so my teacher used this play faster, play slower, and mm. 
I grew up with uh, the sentence like, you know, when you can play it slow and fast, then you can play the, um, the tune. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and also when I trained the scales, they say to me, yes, when you do it all the time in the, in the same kind of way, it will be worse. And uh, they gave me all the ideas of faster or certain emphasis or to change the rhythm. And I see we, we have the same social, socialization inside, but I think they gave me this with another idea. And this talked to me, like I do this for more precise playing. And not that I can find out what maybe I like the most, or mm -hmm. it was more like with an aim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it gave me, it, um, and I'm thinking about what is different in the FanQuest method when we, when we are using constraints. Because to use, to say, are not only playing up and down the, the scales, um, but you put your emphasis on some notes and some not, then it's giving you a border, a constraint. Mm -hmm. And also in the Feldenkrais method, we use constraints. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it's not like a good um, thing to do, like moving when you have your arms so close to you, but it will help you to find out where else you can move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you do your your idea is this good or not? And I think that's the the main um important thing in the fancrest method. Mm -hmm. Not for training you, yeah. but for finding out what you like or what else is possible and it will guide you. So I have the idea that in when you want to build up what no, no, I, sorry, <laughs> I start again. Um, I found out to teach like this, this is wrong, do this, and the, um, the students like to do, they stay with you when you teach like this, that's the other tricky thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they do this and they will be very fast and they can um, very fast play something like we know, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and that's right. Yeah. The other way is much slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the more I'm able to teach like this with, the, with these ideas of giving them the space, space to explore by themselves, I have like parents beside me and they say, oh, can we change to another like genre or like that? They are playing all the time at home. So not with all, but mm. it's coming more and more often to me yeah. that like parents are complaining about that they are playing too much than too less. <laughs> <laughs> yes, more hear. than maybe 20 years before. <laughs> okay, <Wow. laughs> yes. uh, 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 I found out so that they oh. said, "Oh no, not again! This can we have this because she's playing all the time." <laughs> Hats off to you. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's not working with all of them, no, but I, yeah. with yeah. more and yeah. more that parents yeah. are complaining. <laughs> I did have one student tell me last year, uh, we were, he was really wanted to get something and he worked on it. his parents. He told me this parents said, couldn't you play something else? And it made me really sad because I thought this little boy is trying and he, he wants it. He has an idea and he's really working at it. And I know it's, it's trying uh, hard for the, to listen to that same yes. thing over and over. On the other hand, oh, I'll be thankful. He's not, you know, sitting there playing video games. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, that he's playing the trumpet and uh, wow. Um, I wanted to come back to something you said about the variations. Now, I didn't have teachers who were so uh, developed that way. I mean, one of the exercises we have is you take a deck of cards, which there are 52, and you 
you play it once and if it's right you flip the card and you play it again if it's right you flip the card and you, so you're doing trying to do the, get this consistent results by doing the same thing okay. with the idea that practicing consistency uh begets uh consistency and you, you, a lot of the motor learning now like uh, with the golf and stuff you know they say you should hit a hundred balls you know with one and, and that's not true <laughs> no and the irony of it is it that we often feel we've learned something better after doing it that way because but when you go to play it again or perform it it's less reliable than if you had done it many different ways so you you were lucky to have teachers who were were i think a little ahead of the of of the thinking but like you said the the point being are we doing it am, am i having Christina play those scales in different ways because I want her to have a richer experience and to come to her own thoughts or am I doing it because I want her to be a better piano player you know and play it more more correctly so that that thought behind it even if you're doing even if it might look the same from the outside the intent you have behind as a teacher I think is very important uh, of leading someone to discover their own way and and that's tricky in the in especially in the classical music world because we have all these there are rules there are the kind of you play mozart this way and you play you know bach this way and and uh, and then you have within those you have different people with different interpretations but um <laughs> i was listening to an interesting podcast with a guy who taught improvis improvisation and he would improvise on bach and he said one of the reasons for doing is that if you have a memory slip you can continue on and most people won't know it if you're good at it. <laughs> That's a little side note, but I, it's, uh, I thought it was an interesting point. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, about the improvisation about something is, um, so I like so much the, what I, uh, uh, while I studied, I had a colleague and uh, a fellow student, and he came from the um, yeah improvisation, pop music, and he was there very good. And then he came into the university and he had to play all this big piano stuff. So he was a very good piano player, but not so much for the classical side. Mm -hmm. And then he was so stressed out to have um, the class had to play and also he had to play. And it was Kriadin and his um, professor said, oh yes, you have to play, you are such a good player and everything was good and he was so stressed out. And I couldn't hear it, but it was so interesting. After that, he came to me and he said, oh, oh, I messed up, I messed up. But you know, my professor came to me like the arms open and say, Wonderful, wonderful, Mr. Schubert. That's true. His name was Schubert. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And wonderful. So good. So good. And uh, sometimes it was Gerbin. It was. Sometimes it was. It actually was Gerbin. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what, what a good teacher. Yeah. And he was shocked because he thought. She will like not angry but disappointed with yeah. him or something, but she was so lucky because he did it and he played wonderful. He knew what he can do, huh. but he wasn't used to play what he should play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what he played was wonderful. Right, so right. she was happy. And yeah. she she knew it as the beginning and it was not the 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 end of his mm -hmm. study. Yeah. And it will go on. Yeah. <laughs> so that's very yeah. a nice story, yeah. I think. And that was, I was so like, oh, that's cool. Because normally students have inside themselves the idea they want to do it right and good. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to bring them so much into this. You have to do it right. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I think normally students are like this. They want to do it right. And you only have to help them to find out how they can manage this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and be able, and the other thing is being able to hear it. You know, in 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 
felt when we're teaching Feldenkrais lessons, we often will see people moving in ways that we know are not uh, comfortable for them, or it can possibly even could be harmful if they were to keep doing it. And one way in, in I'm sure we've all done this is, you know, stop moving so fast, <laughs> but they also need to develop that sense um, for themselves. And, and that may be, that can take time. Uh, and the same with the musician, I think no kid wants to play wrong notes. They, they just don't hear it. Uh, and, and they don't, or no kid wants to play out of tune or sing out of tune. But that when they don't hear it, it doesn't help them to say it's wrong because they, they don't know what it is for themselves. And that, that comes back to that idea of, of the, the, the cross pollinization or uh, the two disciplines is that how can we get them to sharpen their perceptions, you know, so that they hear it themselves. And of course that happens in normal, I don't, in normal music teaching. It's not that it doesn't happen. People, and it also happens by listening to music a lot too, which is something uh, a lot of kids don't do as much now, I think and access to live concerts and things. But um, how do we develop that sense of, that felt sense and, and listen sense of what feels right and what feels right to me and what feels right to the environment? Yeah. So, yeah. so I think we both are interested in what is the, the deep layer of the fan quest method. And that's not only more for like, if you have an icky, back or hurting knee or sore knee, feet, whatever. But as I know, the fan Christ method is well known for dealing very good with these um, situations. And also that people come to me because they heard about the physiotherapist or doctors maybe, or maybe you should try this, mm -hmm. this can help you or that's very interesting. So how can we know make something a movement into thought to people who maybe followed this conversation and have back pain. <laughs> how, where is the, um, how can we um, help to give um, them a bridge to make the transfer to mm -hmm. this situation? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, one way is, is, is that if you're experiencing pain, your, your mind is, is, um, is being distracted. You know, some of your energy is going to sensing the pain and less of it is available for, for listening to the music and, and, and feeling the, yourself while producing it. So that, that's one thing. But then you often get to that point where I think we, that brings you up to the point where you're starting is that they, oh, my back pain is gone, so I don't need the Feldenkrais method anymore. So how do you develop that sense of, well, this could be interesting for your creative abilities as well. I think that that's how I understand your question. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I find that I don't really have a good answer for that, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than that, if people's curiosity, I mean, becomes, oh, I'm playing better than I was maybe before the back pain. But even then, it's still often about the physical aspect, oh, I'm more relaxed, or I have better posture. Uh, that I think, to be honest with you, I think the only people who can do that are other musicians. Um, I mean, and I mean that absolutely, but to be able to go into that world and say, I've discovered this creativity through doing this and be able to somehow express that and be an example. So that, that's one of the reasons why I keep playing is I, I feel I need to keep my playing up to a certain level um, to, in order to be credible. And I need to test my ideas out on myself um, before I subject my students to them. So uh, that's a really good question um, to how to to make that a clearer connection between, I'll say creativity or art, artistry and um, the kinesthetic sense or the, or the sense of, of, of the, what's learned say from the method. And, and I don't have really good answers for that now. That's one of the things I'm working on. That's one of the reasons why I'm at the music school. 
<laughs> okay. But also I'm interested like, for people who maybe are not musicians and have back pain. It's the same question. Uh-huh. I think because oftentimes people get to a point when they don't have back pain, then they then then it's done. And um it's funny, uh, I had I remember a guy who had back pain and he I he was actually not a client of mine. He was a, a, a I worked in practice in Basel. There were a physio there too and a couple of them. And he came to me because um the physio was sick and he said I just want it to be back like it was before this happened. I think, and, and at the time, I unfortunately wasn't savvy enough to answer his question really well, but the, the, the quest that a better response to that question, I think the one I gave at the point was, if you'd gone back to the way it was before, you would have gotten hurt. <laughs> because <laughs> you need, you see, he wanted going back to having not pain, but, that his way of being before the pain led him to having pain and so to what what he really needed was to develop beyond that sense of self that would cause him to have pain and that's a little bit of similar thing with with the musicians if you say well you don't want to have the pain but that process of of going beyond the pain can also contribute to your your artistry to becoming a better musician but it's really hard for people to see the, the relationship between um, learning and movement. And it's the same with the general public. They, oh, you could actually become a happier person maybe, even if you didn't have back pain, but you continue with um, lessons. And some people do, I mean, some people do make that connection themselves and some don't. And I don't really know how to up the percentage of those who, who who, who do. Uh, I've tried many, many in my practice because I, I remember having people, even practitioners who would go in and they would do the lesson, they would be all, and then they would get up and then they go out and put their shoes on, you hear them bam, bam, stomping around, think, oh, <laughs> and grunting when they bend over to put the shoes on, I think, wait a minute, you just roll off up this, up to sit so nicely and then you go on and slam your body like that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know. Uh, I mean, I've tried many ways and, and you know, there you, you, you make approximations and it gets better, but I, I don't have a good answer to that question, unfortunately. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I think it's about who you are and, and that it contains what I, I love the most of the Fancrest method, I think, is that when you understand that you don't have to change the person in front of you, <laughs> so um, that I only give them the possibility to uh, experience something else, and that this needs time to to spread out through how the, the whole personality. And mm. even when maybe I, I had situations with, with clients, so they said, oh yes, maybe it's because I'm holding my back every time on the right side. And maybe I told them before, oh, please maybe try this. And they didn't do it because it's so wired in and then they, feel it after um, a group lesson or a single lesson with me alone, they feel it and they say, oh, I have to change to this pattern. And then they go out, the back is on the right side and they say, no, no, I can't use a rucksack. It's not pretty enough or I feel <laughs> bad with this. And yes, I know you do all this stuff and, but I have to wear high heels. Yeah. <laughs> it's me. Yeah. And so they come back years after years and well, yeah, yeah, and I try. <laughs> so. or, or be thankful that they do come back years after years. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> going. Well, 
that I mean that brings to me to uh, I had an, an interesting experience with a, a musician. I worked with him. He was actually in a practice. He was a student in a training, and I was a, in a, a practitioner giving lessons. And he sat on the stool after his lesson, and he said, "Wow, you know, I feel more upright, and I can feel how this would be better for my playing, but it doesn't feel like me." Yeah. And at the time, I was a fairly inexperienced practitioner then. Well, I still am, but I mean, I was even more inexperienced than I am now. I was sort of, this is a guy who's a professional musician and in a training, and it's hard for him to adopt a different persona or a different way of being. So what we can't expect that of, of people who aren't as invested in, in, in the training. Um, I had another a similar experience. I met a jazz piano player who had had problems with his hands, and he said a doctor told me I have to sit like this. And he said, "But you can't play the kind of music that I'm playing like this. You know, I have to be like this and play like this." And so that you know that part of the expression, his the way he's expressing his music is involved in a certain kind of posture, and you can't. And I think it was Glenn Gould who you know they were when he would play you know it's terrible and he said but you can't play beethoven this way i think it was you you certainly couldn't you'd have to sit in a different way to play mozart than you would just to play beethoven and that makes perfect sense actually <laughs> because you have to embody a persona persona uh, personify that which you want to express so our it becomes hard and people ask that question oh i feel so great after this lesson how long will this last and I used to say, well, you know, the standard answer, well, it takes time and you, you blah, blah, blah. But I said, how long can you be that person you are right now? You know, so how, how long can you be that person who doesn't need to wear high heels? And then as soon as you go back to being that, you know, because you've changed yourself in the lesson. I always tell them that they've done it themselves, especially if it's an ATM. You've changed. How long can you be that person who you've changed to now? And how long will your environment tolerate it too? I mean, how, you know, the people around you can be uh, surprised if you walk differently or, or look differently. So there's a lot conspiring to hold us the way we are, you know, our, yeah. our habits, yeah. I come back to the student, the, I think he was a pianist. I was in the picture that you said he is in the training and then he tried to play and he said I can't play like this what I felt and now it's maybe better for me or maybe also better for my playing but I can't do mm -hmm. it and that's I think what I felt I felt something similar in my training mm -hmm. that I felt like I don't want to play like before but it wasn't so stable. Um, it wasn't integrated so fast. Right, right. So maybe it's also what is for me as a fan cross practitioner, I need to give them also a lot of possibilities to integrate this, what mm -hmm. they felt, and not only give it up to them, like uh, do something with this, you felt it, and now, now do. And um, but how to do because they go and they need to go and mm -hmm. to integrate by themselves. So it's a lot of being in a spectrum, what we mm -hmm. can do, what we can um, offer or provide for our clients. And, um, but I do understand what he was going through really good. And that's maybe a good um, um example for what happens to all people mm -hmm. yeah yeah and for musicians especially we had to to train this even when we had like teachers like me with more open ideas how to practice mm -hmm. but you have to wire in it's not working without yeah. And uh, then suddenly you have to integrate something new, what you feel so deep inside what's good, but how? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a teaching story for me. I mean, that was, that was a learning experience for me that at that time, I didn't know how, quite how to deal with it, but 
I, you know, when those things happen, I, I reflect on them a lot and how would I do it differently? And what does it mean? So that those are, to me, I, I call them the sort of teaching stories because they're an example of how for someone like that, it's difficult. We have then have understanding for, for everybody you know, uh, and how difficult it can be. And, and, and including ourselves, I mean, I'm sure that many times I had practitioners giving me a lesson and think, why can't he just <laughs> adopt that, you know, or integrate it because it would be better for him. And I probably wasn't ready for it. And, yeah, um, or, um, I don't know, do you know this, uh, the hedgehog, the little, yeah, I think, hedgehog. and the, the rabbit, uh, and the hedgehog, it, the hedgehog it, is the, uh, yeah, uh, and the rabbit, yeah, and there's, um, Cuenta in Spain, <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> it's a Grimm's, I don't think it's um, it's a Märchen in a fairy tale. Uh, a fairy tale, yes. Thanks for helping me out <laughs> with the languages. <laughs> and <laughs> you know this that there's a hedgehog and uh, the man and the woman and the rabbit is running between them. You no, know, I don't think I know it. Oh, interesting. So um there's the the rabbit and the hedgehog and they have a discussion oh i'm faster says the rabbit mm. but the hedgehog is smarter and says to this woman you stand at the end of the field i'm at the beginning and let the rabbit run when i'm out of sight i stepping beside and when he comes to the end <laughs> um, you like running and the the little uh, steps and say I'm here <laughs> and then the rabbit says again and again because he is um, he thinks I'm fast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm faster really I knew it I everything what I experienced until now I have been experiencing until now, I'm faster. And that, that's maybe a good example for patterns. Mm -hmm. They work so good. Right. They but so once good. there comes a point in life, which they are not working anymore like before. And then how to step out of it and not, not like the rabbit to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> out of exhaustion yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes and that's the old pattern one 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 yeah yeah and we try to say look there's this and this and then maybe there are to create situations that they can mirror this they can see this and also give the um, ideas you can go this way not only to stop but you can run this way or there around and to stop in the middle and to say, no, no, I'm fooling them. Or how can I fool this? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, often, I think, fortunately, often people do have to come to the point where they're injured before they're, you know, if the pattern works, then why change it? I mean, that's a lot of the thought that we carry around with us. And it's usually injury or, or some kind of crisis that, that is, takes for people to be motivated to change yeah but i want to turn the tables on you and ask you a question oh yes is that all right? as, a, as, a, as a colleague and, and a musician colleague i've heard people say why do the feldenkrais spend waste time doing feldenkrais when i could be practicing my instrument oh oh i i would say you know the best thing i ever did for my practicing is to do the Feldenkrais method. <laughs> I found out I have really less time to practice um, because I'm doing the Feldenkrais method. It's more obvious with my singing um, uh, lessons more than with the piano. But for example, uh, I had, um, when I was little, I was three years old. I think this is key to understand because I was, in the moment of my developing of my um, um, movabilities, 
like climbing, jumping, mm -hmm. where you all have to do these strong things with both arms and this, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it a long time. And there was a trauma and everything from the, from the accident who was giving me this. And I really was very young. And um, so it is so deep wired in. And I had a problem with, for example, with Chopin, who is familiar with this. You have to swing a lot with the left arm from down to up and to be very um, precise in how you point the arms or you do all with the left hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Mozart, maybe it's not so much um, um, important, but for these things or later on after Chopin, everything what comes is more the, the big movements. And I, there was a hindrance here. Mm -hmm. Everything was okay. With my left side, the doctor said everything beautiful, grown together in this. But there wasn't. Um, there was a time I forgot about the movability, possibilities here. And also, I was wasn't able to to spread the fingers so much. Mm -hmm. And this all, and this was much better. The most I started to discover what what I'm able to do with my left arm also to get rid of the pattern to uh, like um, dissociate from this mm -hmm. part because it was when I was little so hurt. Mm -hmm. There was no surgery. And when they, the, in these times, they didn't give me um, anesthesia to put it in. Oh, yeah. Yes, they throw my mother out and say, oh, you have to go out. And then they heard me cry through the, uh, through the door. Yes, it's a little bit weird. And I was so little, I have no ideas about. It. I think the trauma did it for me. And also I was so little, I didn't remember. No. And this is a very good, um, that, that all um, was, a layer below my possibilities of playing. Mm -hmm. And with all this standing and finding out what my left arm could do. And then interestingly enough, during my Feldenkrais training, I started to ask my mother about it. Mm -hmm. so, so I knew about it, but it was not a big theme because I, I didn't hear it uh, was hurt really like mentally or this I had luck only my clavicle was broken mm -hmm. but then I started which side mom and she said yes the left side and I yes really and then I I felt here the the, the thing that it's bigger here and all yeah. this and really it started to hurt <laughs> When the weather changed, suddenly it hurt and everything. And I felt something here. And now it's gone and I can play better. Mm -hmm. And there was a point in my study, I say, I felt I, it's not how I practice. Also, when, when I try to do all the different stuff, you know, that my training um, my roots are a little bit more freer than yours, but there was no way. Also, I learned that I can do all the stuff mirroring with the right hand. Mm -hmm. That's also very good what we can do on, on the piano, that we mm -hmm. can like mirror what I do here. I do it from above. And so it's very, very good to avoid to over practice one arm. But I was at a wall, it couldn't mm -hmm. go further. Mm -hmm. And then the Feldenkrais method helped me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, to um, reclaim my um, possibilities, mm -hmm. find out what, what can I do because it's, it's not broken. Right, right. But there's missing a certain time which is so important to explore the possibilities and the trauma. Mm. Yeah. Well, so coming back to what I, you were saying before that also with the musicians and, and saying also your practice could become more effective. Yeah, oh yes, of mm. course. Yeah. <laughs> Much more interesting. Yeah, well that too, yeah, of course. <laughs> who, who, 
what practicing should be interesting yes <laughs> are you sure yes of course <laughs> heretic <laughs> Can't be found. <laughs> no, <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> yes. Go away, you're shaking my world. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> I was being silly, but no. <laughs> but I think that's so important to to look at, at it like this. And that that's the thing I say. Sometimes you need to have a certain kind of personality as a musician. Also, I think if you're doing sport or ice skiing, um, the, no, the dancing on ice. Oh, figure skating. Uh, yeah. Figure skating. I knew there's something yeah. wrong in my, yeah. my thoughts about what mm. I want to talk about. Yes, I think I really, I, it's really so astonishing for me how people can so beautiful on ice and all the falling, it's not ballet. They no. are on the, it's cold. The muscles are more tighter and then they do this and they spring like this and they fall down and the feet are in these shoes it's yeah. what i'm complaining about as a musician so i think certain people are more um in the line what they really want to do and what is inside of them what they mm. want to learn and to show to the side and it's mm. so elegant by the way yeah yeah. Yes, <laughs> but this is for me the the example for really. Oh my God, that's mm. that's very. Uh, <laughs> I'm. Um, I think that's very uh, hard to do. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm. John, I think. You, all the questions I had in mind as yes, I had some answers. <laughs> also very interesting insights and you inspired me a lot. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow afternoon when I will teach um, the piano, mm. what will be come out of me and new ideas throughout what you gave to me in this uh, talk and but is there something you want to tell to the world at the end or did I forget something you think oh no Christina we have to talk about it mm. I uh, no it feels pretty complete to me I hope we didn't talk too long um because this is something I love to talk about obviously and, and we 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 seem to, to be a kindred spirits and, and be able to talk I mean, I could continue talking about this with you. Uh, and it's also helpful for me to discuss with other people in the same, you know, similar backgrounds, music teacher and Feldenkrais. So I'm very thankful for that. Right now, I mean, what I'm, thing I would like to say to the world, uh, and it's just reflecting my own uh, state and, and the state of the way the world is, 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 to, is to be kind, kind to yourself. Mm. And I know that sounds kind of, um, no, uh, you know, wishy-washy. But right now, I'm, uh, you know, uh, another time I might say something different. But right now, I think we, 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 you know, take care of ourselves and uh, be accepting of ourselves for who we are and with all our flaws and and, and you know our shortcomings and as well as the good things that we have. Because uh, that's what I would like to say to people. <laughs> Yes, because there we we come to it's like the circle is closing now. If we are all in a situation, I think at the moment we have to change our patterns. Mm. Everyone, even they have no pain, but or something is. But the circumstances worldwide are we have to change. And and the it's so nice you 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 say this with the be careful be kind with yourself and that's really wow yeah you touched me really by heart with <laughs> little tears 
in my oh. eyes. Really. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a good mission to give. Yeah, and and just to bring that back to the musicians, that you know, there's so often so much pressure to be better than you are and to get better and to and to say, but you know, what you're doing is what we're doing, what students are doing is is already wonderful. The fact that they're even trying to play an instrument, even caring to play an instrument, is already a wonderful gift to the world and to themselves and to the family. So that that's that's part of where that comes from is that idea of don't let's not as, as teachers don't be so hard on your students and i'm talking to myself and as students don't be hard on yourselves and as performers uh, uh people you know ourselves christina don't be so hard on yourself <laughs> i mean maybe you're not but i mean those who oh, are yes. studying is, <laughs> because what we're doing is is is, is already wonderful uh, you know so yeah that's that's what I would say as to bring that back to the music. I mean, that, that advice I have is for everybody, but for the musicians and that's what, you know, to keep it focused on that. Um, yeah, be, be kind and be, be thankful for being able to play music. <laughs> yes, and what, what, for beauty and- good What a privilege fun. it is that we can sit here and talk about these things. <laughs> yes, oh, that's, yeah. So thank you, Jean. Well, thank um, you. Yeah. Yes, um, the, uh, also that you gave the time to talk about your thoughts. I think that's also really something special. And thank you for this. And goodbye. Well, let me just say thank you to you before you say goodbye. Also, thank you for the time. And uh, thank, I also appreciate being able to, to share, uh, talk with you and learn from you so, and be inspired by you. So the um, thanks back. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.